Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today I came to introduce something very powerful. And I want to introduce you to a certain glory, to a certain understanding of the glory of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says in Exodus 33, the first verse, The Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, and to the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed I will give it unto you. And the next verse says, And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Those are names for children. You can call your kid Hittite. Praise God. Jebushite. It's better names. Praise God. And he told them that I will send an angel before you. And I want you to listen to this. Because something is going to happen in service that I'm not responsible of except God. He said, I'll send an angel to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hevite, and the Jebushite. And the Bible says, And unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, the children of Israel have crossed over from from Egypt, and now they're in the wilderness. And God is instructing Moses, the man of God, that lead these people through. I'll create an angel before you. He'll defeat all the enemies. But even though my angel will be ahead of you to lead you to the promised land because I promise to fulfill my word. He said, I will not go with you. Why? Because you are stiff-necked. You understand what I'm saying? Now God is trying to give you a picture of how it is possible to fulfill his promise to you You understand what I'm saying? But without a very clear relationship with you. Because he's God. He has to look to his world to fulfill it. It's the integrity of the spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And what do we... What is stiff nakedness? What does it mean to be stiff necked? In Psalm 78 verses 8. The Bible speaks of men which were stubborn and rebellious a generation. And the Bible says that they set not their hearts aright and prepared their hearts to know God. And their spirits, the Bible says, were not steadfastly faithful with God. Give me the amplified of that. He says, do not be as your fathers, as a stubborn and rebellious generation. The word there, stubborn, rebellious, is stiff naked, right? A a, a generation that would set not their hearts aright, nor prepared their hearts to know God. Nor prepared their hearts to know God. Nor prepared their hearts to know God. Whose spirits were not steadfast and faithful with God. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are rebellious people. They are people who set themselves against the steadfastness of the spirit. They refuse to know God. It's one thing for God to avail his knowledge and you refuse to know it. It's another for you to seek and not find. Like the Bible says in Amos 8, where he says that they shall walk north, east, south, and young virgins shall faint for a lack of water because the word of God was scarce and vision was was not there. It had decimated. There was no open vision. And the word of God was scarce. And the Bible tells us, and men ran to and fro seeking the word of God, and they did not find in that day's fair virgins, and young men fainted of thirst. And some even headed into the sin of Samaria. Why? Because the, the word was scarce and vision was not there. But there are people to whom vision, revelation, and all these experiences were there, but they simply refused to know God. Some people, it's, it will amaze you, 
that they have a wishful thinking of knowing God, but not a distinctive desire to know God. They don't want to know God a certain way. And because of that, you, you sort of start to carry a stubborn spirit. You start setting yourself against the course of, 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 of the word of God. When you know what the word of God says. It's like I've been dealing with somebody and I was talking to them about forgiveness. And I'm telling you, look, forgiveness is not a request. Forgiveness is a new creational nature. We are forgivers. I'm not asking you. These are the commandments of the spirit. You either obey or you don't obey. But there are consequences in not obeying the commands of Christ. You see, there's a difference between the commands of Moses and the commands of Christ. The commandments of Christ come in the instruction of the revelation of the person of Christ and his ministry on earth. Teaching to them to observe the things that have commanded thee. For lo, I'm with thee till the end. There are things, some people think the commandments of Moses are the commandments of Christ. No, the commandment of Christ is different from the commandment of Moses. But Christ has a commandment. You understand? There are things that are non-negotiable in the kingdom of God. These are not things that we appeal and plead with you to do. And sometimes you ask yourself, the scriptures are clear that with whichever measure you judge a man, the same measure you will be judged. How can you judge? Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I did not know it. Now that you know it, how do you still wake up and judge? That's stubborn. That's rebellion. You understand what I'm saying? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. The Bible calls it the royal law. Love. It's the, the law of royalty. It's what makes you royalty. Did you understand what I'm saying? It's what makes you royal. He says, fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. That thou love thy neighbors. It's, it, it's what makes you firstly royalty. Royalty, meaning that you belong to a certain kingdom. It's your nature to forgive. It's, it's, it's an underestimation of your nature in God. An identity to refuse to forgive. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that forgiveness means that you're going to wake up in the morning and create a sort of reconciliation that doesn't make sense. Eh? You learn lessons. You forgive, forget, but you learn your lessons too. But you have to learn to forgive. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the Father in heaven sees you too and he counts everything you do. 70 times 7. The acclamation of Cain and Lamech. Who has understood it? The first man who commits sin in history. He said, if any man touches you, I shall avenge his life seven times. And when it gets to the dispensation of a man that reveals the love of God, his understanding of everlasting kindness, it's Lamech. He says, and he that kills Lamech, I shall avenge 70 times. And in the New Testament, it tells you, forgive seven times, 70. Did you get it? So multiply 70 times 7. <laughs> and there's somebody looking at me and say, Apostle, you don't know what that guy did to me. You even cry a bit. <laughs> no, but God knows. Praise the Lord Jesus. That is why as a minister, as a believer, as a Christian, always carry a conscience void of offense toward God. Always carry a conscience void of Always be quick. To repent be quick to change your mind from something when you know it's wrong be quick to change your mind from something when you know it's wrong be quick praise god otherwise the spirit of stiff nakedness is the same spirit that is at work with men who persecute others in the scriptures look at people who are persecutors people who are speaking evil about other ministers of the gospel look at them and check inside there you will see it's a stiff nakedness that's why Stephen asks them in the book of Acts. He says, you stiff naked people. Why resist ye the Holy Ghost? Which of the prophets did you not persecute? Which of the prophets? Stiff nakedness causes you to change your course from the will of God, from the pattern and, and purpose of God. Even in the world, it, it, be, it causes you to become blind and blank of God's purpose. 
you start to set yourself against those whom God has ordained by design. Praise God. He asks them, you stiff naked and uncircumcised in heart uh, and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so you do. And he says in the next verse, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And have they slain them and shot them before the coming of the just one? You see, they killed the Lord's righteous. When you become stiff naked, it's easy for you to, uh, to, to abort divine missions. It's easy for you to frustrate the purpose of God upon your life and on others. Somebody say, the one they are talking about didn't come. Now, he said, because Israel refused to set their hearts to know them, to know him. And, and these are people whom he separated water for. You understand? He, he, he parted the waters. He parted the sea. They were watching. But that does not mean that because a man has experienced a miracle... Therefore, they're going to change. No. No. The miraculous confirm the affirm truths of God. But they're not the standard to prove that because a man has seen a miracle, therefore he's going to change. Some people see all the wonder-working miracles of God and they still rebel against the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? So, Israel had seen God to a certain level. But... They were stiff-necked. And say, God said, you know what? Let me fulfill what I spoke because I'm a God of integrity. Let me fulfill my word in your life. There was no condition on that. You go to the promised land. I'll send my angels before you. I'll kill all your enemies because I'm fulfilling my word in your life. But there's an issue here of your stiff-neckedness. I will not go with you. And the next verse says, when, when and <clears throat> I think it's verse 4, and the people had these evil tidings and they mourned and no man did put on his ornaments. And the Bible says, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up, up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. And therefore now put off thine ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. In other words, make yourself repentant and I will judge the matter. Are you following? And the next verse says, And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the, by the Mount Horeb. And, next verse, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. He left the camp where the what? And then he took the tabernacle of God afar from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which saw the Lord went unto the tabernacle. It came to pass that whoever wanted to go and seek God, they went into that same tabernacle. And the Bible says, which was without the camp. They used to go out of the camp and then they go and seek God. Are you, are you following me? And the next verse says, and it came to pass when Moses was out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. So everybody comes out because they've come to worship. The tabernacle is there. Moses is entering and they all stand out on the door observing the man of God. And the Bible says, and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Now that's what happens. These guys come to worship. They come out. The tabernacle is out there. And then they're standing here. And then they, they, when Moses enters, God covers the entrance with a cloud. Now, I, I don't want you to imagine it in your head as it was happening. I want you to imagine that you're physically in the body, present, outside, on a tent, an open tent. A man of God has entered and a cloud comes from heaven and covers the entrance so you cannot see his worship. And hear what he's conversing with God. Huh? And the Bible says he talked with Moses. And the next verse says, he says, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar. Somebody say amen. They saw the cloudy pillars stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man at his tent door. So they were yes on the tent doors, but they were seeing a cloud and the man of God was behind that cloud in the tent. And the Bible says, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. That means when, when, when Moses enters the tabernacle, Joshua enters too. And he sits in the back. 
And the man of God is serving. Joshua is observing every pattern of worship that Israel cannot see. Do you understand what I'm saying? You realize that this equation is, has given Joshua access simply because the Bible calls him he's the servant of Moses. The rest are regarded as children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, was regarded the servant of Moses. There are places service will take you in God. That no other position can ever take you. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the servant of Moses enters and God accepts him. He doesn't kill him. Are you following me? God doesn't kill him. No, he accepts him to enter. He allows him to enter. Because he knows he comes under the covering of Moses. And so the Bible says, Moses spoke to God face to face as a man would speak to his friend. What a glory. Tell your neighbor, what a glory. Imagine a man talking to, to God face to face. Face to face. They're talking like a man would talk to his friend. No hidden riddles. He says, when I speak to prophets, I speak to them through visions and dreams. He says, but that's not how so I speak to Moses. For I speak to him face to face. I speak to him mouth to mouth. He beholds the very similitude of God. He, Moses was not in the realm of visions. I got a vision last night. No, Moses was not in the realm of visions. He wasn't in a realm of dreams. He was in a realm of God speaking to him face to face as a man would speak to his friend. Now, I want you to understand that God related with Moses as a friend. Somebody shout hallelujah. Of course, the scriptures are clear. How we built this friendship with God. In John chapter 15, verses 14, he says, you are my friends if you keep. You are my friends if you keep. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That's the place of a relationship. How, how do I become a friend of God? Simple. Keep his commandments. In other words, observe his teaching. Observe his teaching. I'll give you an example. Now, of course, when you talk about this, many people again go to Moses. And Paul is not talking about, I mean, Jesus is not simply talking about the commandments of Moses. It's deeper than that. Again, I'm talking about the commandments of Christ. I'll give you an example of one of them. James 2.23. The Bible says in James 2.23, the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, listen, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. That's a principle. Abraham existed before the law. And the Bible has ordained him as the father of all who believe. You understand what I'm saying? And the Bible says he obtained righteousness imputed on his life because he believed on God. And because of that, he became a friend of God. Did Abraham become a friend of God because he did everything right? No. Abraham did not become a friend of God because he did everything right. So I'm not talking about the things you're going to do when we're talking about these commandment things we're talking about. No, 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 no. We're not talking about your definition of commandments. We're talking about God's definition of commandments. Like I said, there's a difference between Christ's commandments and Moses' commandments. They are all in a way working together. They all in a way work in unison with each other to the fulfillment of the bigger plan and purpose of God. But there's a distinction under which these commandments work depending on the covenant with which you're under. For example, in the Moses dispensation, men were justified through works. In Christ's dispensation, men are justified through faith. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called the righteousness of God. Romans 3, 19, 20. He speaks of the righteousness which is of God, which has been revealed and is manifested. It is witnessed by the prophets and the law, which is even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith. It's by the faith. It is by the faith. The righteousness, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ and to all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but they have been justified freely through the redemption that is in him. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. The righteousness of God is different from your righteousness. God is not talking about the stuff you're going to do to please him. He's talking about the faith you have in him to work through you to please him. Who has understood what I just said? And, and people think because we observe lightly the law of Moses, they mean to say that we are not doers of the law. No, 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 no. That's not the fact. The fact is actually the difference between a man under the law and a man under grace is simple. The man under the law 
wears himself out to do to please God. The man in grace, God is pleased with already, and that man receives righteousness imputed, not of works, and that righteousness imputed starts to work through that man to produce the results of a man under the law, yet without the law. Did you understand what I'm just saying? That is the equation of walking with God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, this is a simple principle, a command. Jesus said, you believe in me. That's a command. Believe in me and I shall impute righteousness on you. That's a command. You can choose to obey the command of God or refuse. One man in history, Abraham, received righteousness through faith. He believed God and righteousness was imputed on him. And God told Abraham, you are my friend. Because you've used the true pattern, which is your faith in me to work in you, both to will and to do according to your good pleasure. If you don't understand that, you're not yet a friend of God. Obeying the commandment means follow my pattern of how I do things. Don't follow traditions of men that carry no meaning, meets that... That, 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 that profit not them that, that are indulged in. You understand? You must, you must be established in the word of truth. When you understand what God has told, what he has showed you, what he has revealed through scripture, what, he, what is required of you, you become a friend of... Some people think that you're just going to put your head and results just come because the man of God sees. No, 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 no. Listen. Till your land... The Bible says you shall enjoy sweet bread. What's your land? Your heart. You get my point? Allow the word of God to be planted in your spirit. Understand how the spirit world works through the word. And I'm going to show you tonight why it's important to give the word first place. Some of you, the word is like third. Some of you, even the word, the word of your man of God, Apostle Grace, is bigger than the word of God written. What's wrong with Christians? You understand what I'm saying? Because I told you, gun steal. If a pastor told me to steal, who am I? The man of God has spoken. Let me gun steal. Yeah. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Christ is the standard. Let me I tell people, we men of God did not die for you. Tell your neighbor, no man of God died for you. Jesus did. Somebody shout hallelujah. Listen to your man of God, but only according to truth. According to truth. According to truth. Praise God. According to truth. Don't perish because of me or any man of God. No, 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 no. That makes us now gods in the stead of Jehovah. And that is not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor the one they are talking about did not come. So Moses spoke to God face to face. As a man would speak to his friend. Moses was God's bad day. He was God's tight. He was God's gango. Thank you. He was God's friend. You understand what I'm saying? Now... The Bible continues. Now I want you to understand where this is coming from as I go into where I'm going to delve into. And the Bible says, <clears throat> And Moses said unto the Lord, See, he says, Thou sayest unto me. Now he's trying to, 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 to negotiate over the fact that God has said, I'm not going to go with you. Okay? He's trying to negotiate with God. Okay? He says, You told me, Bring up these people. And thou hast not let me know whom thou will send with me. You're telling me to go with these people, but you're not very clear who I'm going to go with. You understand? Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. You told me two things. Now let's ignore what the people have done. Let's ignore their stiff nakedness. Let's ignore their rebellion. Right? They're stiff neck. We know that. Let's ignore that. Now come to me. You told me, take the children of Israel where they must go. You didn't tell me who I was going to go with. You told me that you know me by name and that I have found grace in your sight. 
Leave the children of Israel out of here. Deal with me as Moses on their behalf. Who's following what I'm saying? Now, let me explain what it means for God to know you by name. You know, if you are thinking of it in the literal way of name, your human understanding of name, God knows everybody's name. You understand? He's not talking about the name your father and mother gave you. In, in Revelations 2.17, he says, Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, and to him that overcometh, listen, the one with ears in the Spirit, the one with ears in the Spirit, he says, He that overcometh, him that overcometh, will I give to eat one of the hidden manna. That means God reveals the mysteries of the Spirit. When your ears are open in the Spirit, you start to see hidden things in His Word. You start to see things ordinary men don't see. Somebody shout hallelujah. Put your hand on your head and say that's my portion in Jesus' name. So you start to see things people don't see. You're given of the hidden manna. Remember, now He's taken you back to Moses' day. Manna used to fall. It was food. Everybody used to see it. They ate food. The, the, it, it was daily. It came in the morning and it came in the evening. Everybody knew what manna was. You understand what I'm saying? But he's saying, but there's food that is hidden. There's stuff that is beyond human scrutiny. That is why he says, pray unto me and I shall show you great and unsearchable things. There's stuff you can't seek. There's stuff in God you can never search. Because it does not come to you by a lasting tweet. It comes to you as you yield to God and pacify the offense of the love that comes through knowledge and judgment that examines the most excellent things. When you understand that, you're without offense. And because yielding pacifies that kind of offense, God gives you the grace. He gives you a certain favor to tap into things. Because one, you're not entering that place by the lust to see. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. No. You're entering that realm because you're established in the love of God. You're seeking God primarily because of your love for Him. You understand what I'm saying? And as you are seeking Him for, in love, you, you, ex, you, 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 you under, knowledge comes to you and judgment. What is judgment? The reconciliation of the spiritual experiences on your life and your intellect to understand them. So knowledge and judgment comes to you. And when it does, because you carry judgment, you approve the things that are most excellent. You carry the wisdom to separate the permissible and beneficial. Paul is a man who had access by God. He had access. And, and, and that's things people never understand. Jesus had access to everything. When he walked the surface of this world. Do you understand what I'm saying? But he was a pilgrim. He was a man on a mission. He wasn't sent to amass wealth on earth. He was sent to preach the gospel and go. Who understands what I'm saying? Now, when, when a man's heart is set on certain things. When a man's spirit is set on certain things. When a man has understood this love. When a man starts to tap into the things that are unsearchable, the things that are priceless, that's why he tells Timothy to lay hold of eternal life. The, the life that is not seen, it's not physical, but it's the experience of, of, of men who, who, who know the difference between our want in the terrestrial and the true want and need of the celestial being. The, the, some of you, everything that you need is because you carry a physical body. Food for the belly. Water for drinking, the clothes you're putting on, the earrings you're putting on. And with women, every part of you demands. The neck tells you I'm bored, you give it a necklace. The fingers tell you they're bored, you give them rings. You understand what I'm saying? The shoulders tell you they're bored, you put a bug there. The, the, the nails, the nails come and then you paint them, everything on you. I even found a woman with, a, with shining teeth recently. She said, oh, said, she had diamond. On the teeth, I was like, how do they do it? Your noses are complaining. Your, 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 everything is demanding. Your hair, your, everything is demanding. You, you've pricked the ears. But that's who you are. Love yourself. Don't worry. You're in the body for a short while. Look beautiful. Somebody shout hallelujah. But all of these things are the desire because you carry a body. And it's good to look beautiful. Don't get me wrong. 
Well, some people say, the Bible says, don't look at the beauty of the outside apparel, but the inward heart, does that mean you don't brush your teeth? And then, no. It's all good. Praise God. Tell your neighbor, it's all good. You know, there are people who have leveled spirituality against how your hair looks like. If you've done your hair, you're not going to heaven. You understand what I'm saying? If you have earrings, hey, you're of the devil. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Tell your neighbor, those ones that are talking about didn't come. Praise God. But are you following what I'm saying? Because I want to go into something so beautiful. Are you following what I'm saying, church? Now, God is trying to show this guy something. He's telling you, look, I want to show you things you can... There are things you... Again, I repeat, there are things you can never search. They are in the unsearchable. You understand what I'm saying? So there is no form of lust... They can only be revealed in love. That is why when Paul comes to the church in Corinthians, he says, I wanted to give you meat, but I still found you as babes because there were strifes, there was malice, there was anger, there were strivings and fights, divisions, and, and you were carnal and walked as men. Up to now, he says, I'm not able to give you meat, but look at envies, strifes, divisions, carnality, all of that is walking out of love. When you understand the revelation of the love of God a certain way, it's amazing what he'll pour on your spirit as a form of revelation. The church in Corinth could not advance to the next level of spiritual understanding because there was division. So sometimes you ask yourself, huh? should I create a division and cut, shortcut, and, I mean, and, 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 and cut out the voice of God that I need for my next revelation? Or should I preach peace in spite of the divisions that my enemy is causing such that I can still continue to hear God? And a stiff naked man hears this stuff and he chooses to pursue war. (laughs) Because that's how they think. You understand what I'm saying? It's like you're going to go places and you'll find people who strive. I have fellow ministers who strive with me. I know it. They do things that are outrageous. They're preposterous. They go talking about me things I don't even have a clue. And they are believed because they are mature. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? And I have the choice also to join their indifference and also start fighting with them. But now, imagine it. I leave Fanero, as beautiful as it, lo- it looks. And then I go with them and fight a guy who, who hasn't even learned to crawl in the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? I also go and start fighting. No. Tell your neighbor, results don't lie. Do you understand what I'm saying? Results don't lie. People ascribe everything to the devil. Everything good is of the devil. And everything bad is of God. You know why we are struggling? Because God is with us. So, permissible, beneficial. What's important, what's not important for me? Now, let's go to... Paul tells you all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. You know, when you understand the law of liberty, you'll be amazed at how many things God can give you access to. But will you carry the wisdom to differentiate what you have access to and can access versus what is expedient for you as a man who is on a mission? And he says, all things are lawful to you. But he says, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Because the things that are lawful have a way to put you under the, their power. Do you understand what I'm saying? They have a way to put you under their power. When the laws of the spirit favor you and give you the things that you've craved for all this while, those things can divert you and have power over you. Some of you are praying because you're not married. Let God get here, Prince Harry. You know, Apostle, <laughs> Thursday, you know, Apostle, <laughs> you do that on Thursday, Vanangi. Tell your neighbor, the one they are talking about did not come. 
<laughs> Glory. You have, I mean, the laws of the spirit will favor you to have money. But is, is money going to have power over you? The laws of the spirit will favor you to drive a nice car. But will that car become your God? You understand what I'm saying? The laws of the spirit will give you children. They will give you everything you want. They will give you a wonderful ministry. But will, will the ministry have power over you? Will you feel more exalted than you ought to be because these things have come your way? Will you lose the pattern and course of your life because God has added another million dollars on your account? Sometimes I look at people who fall very quickly. You understand? Small little money. Some of you, a guy just gets a deal of 200 million, 100 million Ugandan shillings. And they become busy. <laughs> Praise God. Say in the mighty name of Jesus. I shall not be brought under the power of the laws that favor me. Say it again in the name of Jesus. I shall not be brought under the power of the laws that follow me and favor me. Say amen. amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but, but it's something I need to show you. It, when he tells the revelation that he, he that overcometh, he says, I will give of the hidden manna. And the Bible says, and I will give him a white stone. And in the stone he says, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. In fact, the literal definition of the name there and how it is given is the very definition moses is referring to when he said you know me by name when he said you know me by name he wasn't talking about god calling him moses no god called him a certain way somebody shout hallelujah he had a spiritual name god called him a certain way and 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 this is the thing about it when you start to hear god a certain way he calls you a certain way he gives you a name because you've, you've entered the deeper place of hearing him. And that name can be said and everybody else hears a trumpet. But in that trumpet you hear an instruction. You see, the voice of God is not one dimensional. Why do you think the Bible says wisdom is crying out on the streets? The Bible says wisdom is crying out on the streets because the spirit of wisdom, as it is given by God, does not come one-dimensional. The streets have everything. And everybody. Do you understand what I'm saying? They have different artifacts and elements of definition. And in there, wisdom is crying out. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Her voice is uttered very clearly. God, some of you think eh, that a still small voice has to come and, they, and God tells you the mystery of godliness is like this. Sometimes it might come that way. But sometimes God can teach you in the smallest things the deepest wisdom ever. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that is why wherever you're walking release your spirit to understand that you are a steward of mysteries. I'll teach that soon. Maybe next Thursday, I don't know. That you're a steward of mysteries. He says, let a man so account, him, account himself as ministers and stewards of the mysteries of God. That means you are the carrier of mystery. I'll, I'll explain that. You are a carrier of mystery. You, you, are, you are the demystifier of everything that is mysterical about the person of God. Why? Because everything out of you oozes the person of Jesus Christ in his wisdom and knowledge and, and, and understanding. Somebody shout hallelujah. So when people say wisdom, cries out, uttereth her voice on the streets. Some people think the logical things that come to you when you're observing the world. No. No. You see, even vision has places. I wish I have the grace to explain to some of you the places. One day I'll, I'll explain to you the, experience, the vision that 
Abraham heard about Christ and where he had it from. You'll be amazed. The place where Abraham, you see when the scripture says in the New Testament that your father rejoiced to see my, your father, my, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. He rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. It, when you go in the scriptures, it's a very clear, clear demarcation place from where he saw God. But he didn't just see Jesus appear only. He, he saw the days to come. And he uttered a prophetic word that looks very simple, yet it's very profound. Sometimes God speaks to you from the realm where you see. It's not that when you wake up and walk on these streets, huh? He speaks of how when you walk on the streets, the citadels, huh? and observe them, the trees and everything. And then he says, and then you come back and have a message for your generation. Because you observe the streets and the bulwarks and the citadels and everything. See, th- these streets we are talking about are not physical streets. It's not when you stand on Kampala Road. And as you're standing on Kampala Road, a taxi passes and says, oh, Wisdom. No, 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 it's not all about that. No. He said, you are coming to Zion. The city of God. The city of God. We're talking about the streets of Zion. You've come to Mount Zion. Right now, let's go back to that scripture of Zion. When he's talking about that place of walk about Zion, he's talking about round about her, tell the towers thereof, mark you well all our bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. He's not talking about a physical street. He's talking about the dwelling place of the redeemed. He's talking about the, the, the inheritance of the saints. What it means to... This is a Zion street thing. It's not a Kampala Road street. So his wisdom is crying on the streets and then you see a matatu passing. That means that the American who has never seen a matatu will never carry the wisdom you carry in Kampala because you have a matatu. You understand? Oh, the British guy that I know, a border border, that presupposes that they will never know God a certain way because you have seen a border border. Ah, wisdom is on the streets. No. This is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual picture. If if you never walk about Zion, you will never have a message for your generation. Revelation comes generational. Do you understand what I'm saying? Revelation is released in the generation. What is a generation? The time you are alive. So I see some, some old guys who say, you know I'm 60, but you are generation. No, we're not talking about physical generation. We're talking about God's definition of generation. You are in my generation because you are alive now. And we plan to see you alive until 120. So tell your neighbor we're still around. Do you understand what I'm saying? But until you walk a certain place in the spirit, you will never have... When he says, come and tell it to the generation following. Well, come and tell it to the generation, the one you're in and the one to come. That dispensation that makes you relevant, not only now, but even when you're gone, you'll have a certain significance in the spirit. That distinction comes by walking in the right places. And the city, the streets we're talking about are not Kampala Road. Zion. The city of God, the company of innumerable angels, to the spirits of just made by perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the covenant, whose blood speaks better things than the blood of Cain and Abel. Somebody say, I walk there because I dwell there in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, when he is talking about the place of the name. It's, some, it's, it's a, a certain calling God gives you. A certain name he ordains on you because you've learned to hear him in the deeper places. And this is what Moses is claiming on his life. Praise the Lord Jesus. He says, you gave me a name and you have also told me that I've found grace. If you've given me a name by the place I've earned with you by grace to hear you a certain way. And see you face to face while others celebrate visions and dreams. And you tell me that I've found grace. How do you tell me that you're not going to go with me? Now leave the people alone. Me, I'm taking them. So you're going to leave me with them? 
And then you stay behind. Praise the Lord Jesus. Because there's that distinction of that name. Now, the other thing about this naming. Why it's Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 3. In, in, in the book of... Of course, many of you don't read it. The Bible says... That those are the most unread books. Solomon, Revelation. Revelation, the book of Revelation. It says, Because the server of thy good ointments, thy name, is an ointment poured forth. You see, your name is an ointment poured forth. The word there for ointment, in both, good ointments and ointments, is the anointing. It's the anointing. The name he gives you defines the degree of the anointing working on your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, it's the degree of the glory of God that operates on you. You are walking, you are functioning according to the degree of the anointing that is at work in your life. Certain things cannot move because of where you are in the anointing. Because of the fatness of the oil upon your life. The more you grow in the things of your spirit, the Bible says, and the yoke shall be broken because of the fatness of the anointing. The Bible doesn't say the anointing shall break the yoke. Again, I say, it's not the responsibility for the anointing to observe a yoke to break. Because the anointing has no business with even observing a yoke. No. It's the yoke breaking because, he says, and it shall be in that day that the burden of the Assyrian shall depart from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the fatness which present, prevents it from going around your neck. Do you know what that means? When a yoke goes around any animal's neck, it means that it's under the bondage, it's under the control, it's under the, the permission of whoever has put a yoke on it. You understand? When, a, when an animal feeds and feeds, give an example of an animal feeding, to a place where it becomes so big, and the yoke starts to break off because of the fatness. That's what he's talking about. That as you continue to increase in God, as you continue to allow God to work through you, you'll get to a level, whether your family doesn't get married, whether you have generational castles, whether you have things that refuse you to get married, there is a point in God where you reach and the devil says no. The fatness can't let me. Some people say we come from generations where people don't give birth. Listen. Stir it up. Hallelujah. Allow the anointing to grow on you. Oh, in our family there is poverty. Oh, we don't have money. No, no. Get the oil. Tell your neighbor, get the oil. The money will come. Get the oil. Deliverance will come. Understand the oil. Healing will come. Tell your neighbor, Tomotia, understand the oil. Your ministry will grow. Understand the oil. Favor will befall you. Understand the oil. You'll stand before kings and not before mean men. Understand the oil. Hey! Understand the oil. Understand the oil. The yoke is broken because of the fatness. That's why I tell people. Don't go for deliverance services. Or we have a deliverance service. And then you take your head. No. Go for anointing Holy Ghost services. Somebody shout hallelujah. Go for the fatness of the oil. The word that I speak to you. It is spirit. And it is life. Pursue the word of God. Allow it to sink in your spirit. Let it enter in you day and night. Hallelujah. Listen to it in the bathroom. Listen to it in the car. Listen to it in your bedroom. Walk with it in the word. Confess it. Keep saying it. Do it everything. A time will come when the yoke can't resist the fatness which presents it, prevents it, the Bible says, from going around your neck. There are people in this world you can't bewitch. There are people in this world you can't frustrate. Oh, you speak all you want, they'll still go up. Why? Because they are not at the level of the size of your yoke. Hallelujah. There are people you cannot talk down about. There are people the devil knows. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Maybe you're living in a cheap bedroom, a cheap little house. You don't even have money for rent. It's only a matter of time.
the devil will appear and his yoke will appear smaller and he'll come to do it like this on your neck and you go back and say it can't fit the woman is anointed it can't fit slap somebody and tell them they are talking about me I'm anointed hallelujah I'm anointed by the oil of the son of God I'm anointed by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and it cannot leave my mortal life to disappear and be destroyed I'm anointed by the same power that separated the seas I'm anointed by the same power that uplifts the lowly that same power that makes access float that same power that brings numbers multiplies increases brings salvation that same power of the son of God I'm anointed I have oil on my head tell your name I have oil on my head I have oil on my head somebody shout hallelujah shout hallelujah now the Bible says In verses 14. No, he says 13. Now therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider this nation is thy people. And he said, this is God, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. That's why I tell people, when you start feeling the presence of God upon your life, you cannot be anxious about situations. Why? He is with you. You and him are the majority. Somebody shout hallelujah. You don't need 20,000 people with you. Uh -uh. If God be on your side, he didn't say no one. He said who? I love, I, love the, I, I love the humor of the word. He didn't say no one can be. He asked who can be. And who? So it's like God is saying who? It's like God is he's in fighting mode. He's saying ah, ah, who? Who? Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Now the Bible says, let's continue a bit because I need to finish. And the next verse says, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with us, carry us not this. You know, it's useless for us to enter a promise without an anointing. It's useless for us to enter the promised land flowing with milk and honey without oil. Now, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? That, that's, that's what they call grace. When a man has found grace. <laughs> now, I hope you understand. Hey, the oil has begun. That, that, that's, that's when a man has found grace. Hallelujah. A certain oil flows on you. A certain great glory, a certain presence is tangible in your life. That's a man who found grace. Hallelujah. And he says, it, is it not in, in, in that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all that are upon the face of the earth. He's saying that's the only thing that separates God's people and everybody else on the face of the earth. That oil, that glory, that presence. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, let's rush out through because I want to finish. And the Bible says in the next verse, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Because I know... Again, God repeated those two things. Because you have dug a certain place with me, and you have found grace. Let's ignore what I wanted to do to the children of Israel. It's alright. It's okay. It's alright. I'll not destroy that. Because there is one guy in there. You understand? And he said, now this is Moses. He says, okay. No, let, let's begin from, 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 yes, 18. And when God told him that because you have a name with you and because I have dealt with you in grace, I will go with you. Moses knew what he needed. He tells God, show me 
thy glory. I want to understand this thing. Now this is where I wanted most. The whole sermon was leading us here. Now, the Bible says, And he said, I will make all my, this is God, I will make all my goodness, all my goodness, This is God defining his glory. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. My name, him as Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That's, That's God's glory. And the next verse says, and he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. Now, let me explain this. There are three kinds of glory. Kabod, Shekinah, and Doxa. Kabod, the glory Kabod, is the presence, the glory of God revealed in the things we see after his creation. Shekinah is the manifest presence of God without a man. Like that burning bush experience that Moses had. You understand, like the separation of the waters for the Israelites to pass through. Doxa is the New Testament dispensational glory that defines you one with him and seeks to give you all that he is and has. But in the kinds of this glory, glory also has degrees. Do you understand? There's a degree the prophet could explore. The man of God who enters the presence of God could explore. That degree... Not the whole of Israel could behold. That is why when Moses enters that realm of service with God, there is a cloud that covers them. What Israel saw in that dispensation is the second degree of glory. There is a degree that Israel, or all the nations, or the nations that worship see, the general line of believers, basic line. You understand? And they used to see the cloud. It used to come on the tent. And then it used to cover. That was the glory of God that came in a pillar of a cloud. In fact, later you realized it was the cloud by day and, and the fire by night. They saw God's glory to that level. But while they saw the cloud and fire, Moses saw beyond the cloud and fire. There was a glory he could explore. That means, that's why every time he entered the presence of God and came back, the Bible says his face started shining. And they could behold it and it was shining as of that, as of an angel. The only difference was that he has under a dispensation of that which waxes off, even in his own glory. And that is why he used to put a veil over his head. That they would not see the glory diminish. And there is a glory which no man can see and live. He said, there is a glory which no man, no man, he says, no man shall see and live. In Timothy 6.16, he says he, he dwells in immortality. In that realm, he dwells in immortality. He's not just the immortal God. No, he has immortality with him. He says, dwelling in the light which no man can approach and to whom no man hath seen, nor can see to whom be honor and glory and power everlasting. There is a glory that no, the terrestrial cannot withstand. If it stands, if it stands, that man will die. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a glory a man cannot stand. A human body cannot stand without dying. You, you, the moment you step in it, your terrestrial being that breathes oxygen and pumps blood cannot stand. It would literally melt in that glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? So God told Moses, you cannot see my face. Now I want to show you something. And leave. Huh? And the next verse says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. Now, now listen. He, he just didn't create a place. He says, There is a place by me. The, behold. But you have to see it. You have to see it. This is a spiritual place. It's not a physical place. He says, Behold, there is a place by me. And thou shalt stand upon a rock. Are you hearing me? And remember, the Bible says it was the rock from which they drank. It followed them by night. It followed them by day. And that rock was Jesus Christ. He says, behold, there's a place by me. And thou shalt stand upon the rock. And he says, listen. And it shall come to pass, 
while my glory passes, that I will put thee in a cleft of that rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass. And the Bible says, and while I take away mine hand, thou shalt see my back parts, but my face you shall not see. Now, I, I am putting myself in the feet of Moses. He's cleft in a rock. God is putting his hand, and he senses that the hand is going off, and he has to look back to know how the back of that infinite celestial looks like. The one without beginning of days. How he looks like. And he could only behold the back of that man. He could only behold the back. Cleft in that rock. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the only way to have the full vision of Christ cannot be in the terrestrial you will die. It can only be as we transcend into our celestial nature and see through the eyes of the rock of our salvation, which is Jesus. He's not saying that that place is unattainable while we're still in the body. He's only saying that we need to take on a form which is not human to see a glory that cannot be seen by men. That is why he's defining you as an eternal being. The person of Christ, this rock, this rock that we're talking about, the one they drank of water, it, it fed them water, they, but that it didn't shed its blood for them. It did not give them a new life. They are not a new creation. You remember when he brings the definition of the new creature, it is so natural. It is raised spiritual. That new man in you is not a physical man. If he was a physical man, he would not stand this, that degree of glory. But because that man is of the spirit, he that is of born of the Lord is born of the spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. We are not born of flesh and blood, neither the will of God. But the Bible says, but they were born of God. The eternal sperm of Jehovah entered you. It, 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 was, it was produced and, and gave you force as the offspring of God. That means, even though no man can access that degree, you can by the spirit. You can by the Spirit. You can by the Spirit. You can't physically. But you can by the Spirit. Now imagine this God taking our faces, Moses beholding, and then he disappears. You can't see my face. And then he tells us, this is the mystery that was hid from the edges past and now revealed. Carry them in front. Christ in you the hope of glory in whom, the Bible says, it pleased the Father that in Christ should dwell the fullness of God bodily. If the God who puts a hand to cover Moses, Moses is this tiny thing, he has to cover to see, tells you that now I'm in you. I'm in you. Now I know why Paul says I'm dead yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ. And the life that I now live, the zoe that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a dead man because the things I've seen, men in the flesh can't see and live. Somebody raise your hands and start to receive it. I see the presence of God here. You might ask yourself, what's the use of this glory? If you do that, then you have not understood what I was preaching. Jesus says, my glory have I given them. He said, my glory have I given them? And yet that same Bible says that Jesus dwells in that light. He dwells in that light. That's what he told Timothy. He told him that you, you, you will see Jesus Christ in his time and he shall show you the blessedness, the only potentate king of kings and lord of lords who has immortality dwelling in the light which no man can see. 
this Jesus dwells in that light. And that same Jesus says, my glory have I given them. I'm talking of a glory beyond what Israel can see. I'm talking of the glory beyond what a man of God can explore. I'm talking of the person of Jesus Christ. Power of the Holy Ghost! This is the realm of your glory. This is the realm of your grace. I can feel your mighty power. It is moving in this place. This is the realm of your glory. This is the realm of your grace. I can feel your mighty power. He is moving in this place. Holy, holy. Carry them. Holy. Receive it. Oh, you are holy, 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 holy. Come on, speak in tongues for two minutes. For two minutes. For two minutes. If you don't have tongues, receive them. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, help me. Put it on somebody. Put it on somebody. Put it on somebody. Oh my God! The Lord kills you. Oh prophets it's coming power of the ghost power of the ghost apostles it's coming power of the ghost oh evangelists there are about 37 of you here my god my god power of the ghost Miracles, signs, and wonders. This is the realm of your grace. Like a sound of many waters. It is moving in this place. It is the realm of your glory. I can feel the mighty power. The Lord tells me there is more. I want to close the meeting, but I feel there is an outpouring. I see it with my eyes. I see God pour something. Take it! Take it! Take it! Holy. Holy. God is opening somebody's spiritual ears. Oh, your spiritual eyes are opening. Oh, help. Holy. Even my ashes are slain. So us your glory that is revealed in Christ. Let it be seen that all men see. Let miracles, signs and wonders, let your power, let your glory, let everything that you've put in Christ start to manifest through us. Struggle is over. If you're sick, God heals you now. Start to do something you could not do before. Your finances are changing. Your marriage life is changing. Get the oil. Your struggles are over. Receive the oil. Hey, there he goes. 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 
There it goes. That spirit that refuses people to get married. The anointing. The anointing. The anointing. The anointing. Barrenness is judged. Sickness is judged. Poverty is judged. Struggle is judged. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Stretch forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. I feel healing has taken place. Somebody is getting healed with a hip issue. Check your hip. If you have a bone hip issue, if you have a bone hip issue, if you have a bone hip issue, I feel God is healing a bone hip issue. Check your bone. Start to walk a bit. God is healing. There is somebody that had a stuck knee. You could not bend your knee. God is healing you now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Deafness of the ears. They are opening. Your blind eye, unclear sight. God is healing. HIV. You're cursed. Cancer is cursed. In the mighty name of Jesus. I decree upon your life that you're going to serve God. You're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You're going to shake this world. This generation is yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Nothing will slow you. Nothing will, will stop you. Nothing will kill you early. I decree long life upon you. I decree a quickening of the spirit. While he restores whatever was lost. In Jesus mighty name. And all saints said. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.